Splendor, what are you doing out here? It's cold. I'm inside getting ready to shoot my segment. What? Nobody forgot about your birthday. We all know that you're one today. And look, I even got you something here. Go ahead and make a wish. That's real nice, Blender. Happy birthday. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Board Game Blender. My name is Z Garcia. Today we are going to be talking about designer collaborations. Uh, designers coming together, whether they work frequently or not, and designing a game together. You know, I remember uh, some time ago when I was getting into gaming and I started to notice that uh, that I was able to, uh, to, to follow a link between a designer and whether or not I liked their games. You know, and I started to to follow these uh, these people, like I could follow a book author or a movie director, and eventually started noticing also that they would sometimes work together, and that was really interesting because I could um, I started figuring out that I liked what some of them put out almost always, and sometimes that person would work with someone I was either not familiar with or t whose games I tended not to like, and so. It's very interesting, and then I would play that game and think, huh, this feels like designer A more than designer B, and sometimes it was the other way around, and sometimes you were like, okay, this is a new thing, and sometimes they were just uh, bombs, you know, sometimes it was two people I knew I liked who hadn't worked together, they would work together, and I would not enjoy that game at all. So uh, I've always been kind of fascinated by the idea of... Uh, collaboration in board games especially at a high level like that where it's you know the, the concept of the idea coming together uh, from the designers because of course there's a lot of collaboration in both video production like this and in uh, publishing you know there's got to be so today we're going to be talking about that and we're going to be talking about uh, lots of different games hopefully and I, uh, I hope you enjoy the show as always thank you for joining us let's kick it off Tiff here. This week we're talking about designer collaborations. Now my middle school board game club kids don't pay much attention to designers, but I do. And when I saw there was a family game made by two of my favorite designers, I had to get my hands on a copy. Antoine Bauza and Bruno Cathala are each responsible for some of our most requested games at the club. When these guys collaborate, it's all but guaranteed to be excellent, and they didn't disappoint with The Little Prince, Make Me a Planet. The Little Prince Make Me a Planet from Asmodee Games is a quick tile drafting game for two to five players. Theme-wise, each player is trying to build the best possible planet for the Little Prince's animals out of 16 different tiles. To set up, you sort out the tiles into four different piles, one of each type. Each tile will be a small piece of your planet, containing foxes, sheep, snakes, elephants, flowers, volcanoes, and baobab trees. Each round, the start player will choose one pile to draw from, taking as many tiles as there are players. After choosing a tile for themselves, they'll pass the rest of the tiles to the player of their choice. This process is repeated until the last player is forced to take the final remaining tile. That player will get to start the preceding round. The corner tiles contain special characters that determine the endgame scoring for your planet. There are 11 different characters, and most of them give various amounts of points for collecting sets of animals, sunsets, stars, or other symbols found on the tiles. The number of baobab trees on a planet also affect its scoring. If you draft the gardener, the trees will score you points, but it's risky. If you grow more than two baobabs, the tree tiles get flipped over and aren't counted for scoring. Of course, there's always the drunk who scores points for each flipped tile. Once you've constructed your entire planet and totaled the points earned from your characters, the volcanoes are counted. The planet with the most volcanoes suffers a penalty equal to its number of volcanoes. Of course, the player with the highest scoring planet wins the game. The Little Prince Make Me a Planet is a testament to collaboration in game design. Bruno Cathala and Antoine Bauza somehow managed to take a very simple, easy-to-teach mechanism and turn it into an engaging family game experience. 
I love that you can set up, teach, and play the game in under 30 minutes. And there's some good decision making in there too. The kids seem to really enjoy picking which tiles will help them the most, and weighing that over which tiles will hurt their opponents. The literary tie-in is a nice plus, not to mention the small box hardly takes up any shelf space. I really can't think of any reason not to give this one a try if you have children that enjoy games. So check it out, and I'll see you back next time. Hey guys, what's going on? I'm Roy Canne, and this is From Easy to Epic, where we talk about an easy game for more of a beginner, and then we talk about an epic game for more advanced play. This week on The Blend is all about co-designs, games with multiple designers. Um, the first game we're going to be talking about is Doodle Quest. Doodle Quest is a competitive game for one to four players, where players are trying to draw on a transparency to complete quest and gain points. The player with the most points at the end of the game wins. Each player will be given a transparency and a dry erase marker that they'll use to complete a bunch of different quests. The quests are pictures that have different activities that you have to complete, like drawing lines or using stencils. You draw on the transparency and then place it above the quest picture to figure out how well you did. There's a large variety of different quests and activities in Doodle Quest. You're trying to figure out how to draw your lines without making them too far or going out of the lines, using those stencils to get things just in the right place, and using a lot of spatial recognition and trying to figure out where exactly on that transparency you need to draw so that when you transfer it over to the picture, it'll be in the correct place. Depending on how well you do depends on how many points you get and the player with the most points after doing six different quests is the winner. Designers Laurent X. Goffer and David Frenick work together to make a unique and interesting game that's just as fun for kids as it is for adults. They also designed a dungeon crawl themed game called Looney Quest in the same vein. Doodle Quest is a ton of fun with all the spatial recognition of trying to figure out how to draw on the little transparency there. It works great with kids and with non-gamers. It's a lot of fun, so if you're looking for something super easy to teach and super easy to learn, check out Doodle Quest. Um, the next co-design we're going to look at is Dead of Winter. Dead of Winter is a semi-cooperative game for two to five players where players are trying to complete a quest while surviving the zombie apocalypse but mostly surviving the other players. To win the game, the colony must complete the main objective, but to be a part of that victory, each player must complete their own secret objective. There's also a chance that one of the players could be a betrayer. Their goal is to complete their secret objective and then drop the colony's morale down to zero, causing all the other players to lose. Instead of winner, you have to balance completing the main objective, working together so that crises don't fail, making sure that the colony's not being overwhelmed by zombies, and completing your own secret objective. Designers Isaac Vega and Jonathan Gilmore did an awesome job at betraying the zombie apocalypse with all the moral questions and questioning everyone around you, just working as hard as you can to try to keep everything afloat, and there's always a chance that someone's going to come and stab you in the back. The Crossroads events also add exciting things that happen that always fit into what's going on currently in the game. I love how in Dead of Winter it feels most of the time like you're actually surviving a zombie apocalypse. These crisis cards are coming out, you're trying to figure out how to scrounge up the resources you need and make sure everybody's putting in the right thing, but then there's always the threat of the betrayer that's going to put in something wrong, and then there might be people that are more worried about their quests that they have to complete for themselves, their primary objective, and they might be holding stuff back that they could be putting in because of those. And it puts you in these moral situations on a lot of the crossroad cards where you're like, is this what we need to do? What's going to be the right choice? Um, the crossroads mechanic overall is super interesting, how the events come out, and it's always very thematic to what's currently going on in the game. It also gives players a chance to like, on another player's turn, be like, oh, is it going to trigger? Is it going to happen now? So that's always super exciting. So if you're looking for a zombie-themed game, make sure to check out Dead of Winter. It's definitely the best out there. Well, that's it, guys. This has been From Easy to Epic. Thanks for checking us out, and we'll see you guys next time. Mmm. Uh. Got it. Vault Wars. Hello! Welcome to Boards and Crafts, a place for quick tutorials with snacks and crafts inspired from games, board games, and all about board games. 
Fault Wars is a fun game that was designed by Jonathan Gilmore and Ben Harkins. And today I'm going to show you guys how to hide your gold with some loot chests. Let's get started! The supplies that you'll need for this project are as follows. Some sandpaper or some other type of material that can grind down all of the paint that's on the um, tins that you'll be using. And a collection of supplies for whenever you actually paint. You will need primer and some varnish for this project as well as having a cup to put all of your dirty water in, paint brushes, something to put your paint on, and acrylic paint, which is preferred. You can use something else, but I don't think that you'll get the same result. Just saying. Before you get started, I suggest that you get some type of paper to put below your tins whenever you're working on them because you will have a lot of a mess with this project, so you'll want to be able to clean this up efficiently and that's usually the best way. I usually will cut up the sandpaper before I get started because this is more of a hands-on project and since I don't have a sand grinder, I forgot the actual term, term of it and I'm sorry for that, um, I cut it up that way it's easier for me just to use my hands with this. So I scratch up the top of the tin and try to take off the um, coloring and paint that's already on it. That way I can design it how I want to. This sandpaper will have grinds in the tin so that your primer will stick on better. So at this point, um, the primer, it's easier if you have a spray can and if you use the spray, please do this outdoors. I don't want you to, you know, have problems with fumes. <laughs> I don't know how else to, else to say that, sorry. And I just put on white paint and just went with that and let it dry. Uh, the next step was adding on the brown paint and I just got a medium sized brush and just did long strokes on it and found that that made it look like a wooden boards on there. And I let this dry for about an hour. Then I returned and got a tinier brush and used some black paint to do the details and just did long streaks of black on the top to make the wood look split. Let that dry for a bit and then I got some metallic paint and paint it on top of it to make it look like it has little iron bands on top. And after all of this dried, I put some varnish on it, that way it can stay all on there and I don't have to worry about it getting on my bookshelf or anything else. And that's it! If you guys have any ideas for tasty treats or creative crafts about any of the board games mentioned in this video, comment below or tweet them at me at Artsy Robot. Thank you guys for watching and I hope that you have a great day. I'm a big fan of Rummy, and I've uh, always been a fan of games that take a classic uh, system like that, like Rummy, like Poker, whatever it may be, and then uh, twists it a little bit, pretties it up, and gives you something interesting and new, but based on something you are very familiar with. Now, it's true those games can, can sometimes bomb, but uh, if care is taken with them and you can both see the roots and see the, the fruit of the new game, then I think you're off to a good start. And so a uh, series I've always liked is Mystery Rummy here. I have Mystery Rummy, the uh, Al Capone one, and Mystery Rummy, Jack the Ripper. I've played a whole lot of this one. And so today I'm highlighting the latest in the Mystery Rummy series, and that's Mystery Rummy Escape from Alcatraz, that is from both Mike Fitzgerald, who is the designer of the other games, and then uh, Andrew Corson, who uh, had the original design and then took it to Mike Fitzgerald and they worked on it together from that point. The game um, follows a lot of the same ideas that the other Mystery Rummy games have followed before, which is um, you are drawing cards, you are making melds, you are typically attempting to go out, but of course on top of that you will then score or you will have some sort of twist based on whatever literary work or, or historical uh, time and place is being discussed in the game. And so, for instance, in Jack the Ripper, you are attempting to discover the mystery of the killings, uh, and you have to be careful to not let Jack the Ripper get away, or maybe, depending on your hand of cards, if Jack the Ripper gets, gets away, you will score well. So in this new one, you are um, putting together the, the, the plans are being put together for escapes, and uh, you are grabbing the characters that are in jail, you are playing the card melts, but I really like the new twist, and the main thing in this game is a deck of cards from which you are going to be drawing cards, which are um, sort of actions that, that take place on your turn 
that are just events, really. Now, they're fairly basic events. It's not a it's not an adventure-driven story or anything like that. But I like that it introduces into the game some uncertainty. You're not quite sure what's going to happen, and it's not just as straightforward as a deck of cards you draw and play from. But these cards might... Uh, come along at exactly the right time and give you exactly what you want, or they might mess up your plans a little bit. And so you have to deal with that. I like that. I've always enjoyed games that have a good balance of tactics, mostly tactics. I enjoy strategies, but tactics is what I love. And luck. Luck enough that, um, you know, not everything is in your control and you can sort of go along for the ride. Escape from Alcatraz, I, I, when it came out, I reviewed it, I remember that, and, and it got a few other reviews from other folks in the industry, and I have not seen too many people playing it myself. I, um, I don't think I've ever seen anybody else except for a review uh, sitting down at a table and playing it, and I think it's a shame. I think this is a great card game. It's well produced. It's, uh, it fits into the rest of the line here. Not that I have them all, but it fits into the rest of the line very well. And I am glad that the, they have kept the series here alive and uh, going. And so uh, Escape from Alcatraz, the card game and Mystery Rummy, I highly recommend it. Uh, go and check it out, especially if you, like me, are a fan of uh, classic card games with a little sprinkling on top of something new. I think this one tackles the new part very, very well. Check it out. Hey there, I'm John from John Gets Games, and today we're talking about collaboration in board game design. Specifically, I'd like to talk about cases where a game is designed by one person, it gets published, and then they reach out and collaborate with another designer for a new spin on that previous game. Uh, the two examples I'd like to cover are Seven Wonders into Seven Wonders Duel and Pandemic into Pandemic Legacy. So let's start with Seven Wonders. It is designed by Antoine Bauza, and it was a hugely successful game uh, where up to seven people could kind of build their little empire in a very abstracted way. It's really just a hand drafting game where you just pull one card out of a hand and pass it to the person next to you every single turn and then you kind of build up a tableau in front of you. You aren't interacting with really anyone else on the table except the people immediately next to you and you can kind of pay for their resources and fight them with wars but realistically that's just if you have more of an icon they lose one point and you might get more points than that so it's a tiny swing and you can kind of ignore the military if you want to. Um, and then you bring in Seven Wonders Duel, which is a two-player only uh, game, which is a new take on Seven Wonders, where instead of hand drafting, you're doing pool drafting, which is drafting cards from an open tableau in the center of the table. And in comes Bruno Cathala as a co-designer for this game. Now, Antoine Bauza is known for these more pleasant games like Hanabi and Takedo and Seven Wonders where there is some interaction, sometimes they're cooperative games, uh, but they're not really in-your-face style games, whereas Bruno Cathala is known for many more in-your-face style games like uh, Cyclades and Abyss and Jamaica and many other games. So both game designers kind of brought what they're good at together to make this collaboration of Seven Wonders Duel, which feels like Seven Wonders, but it's so much more intense. There's a lot more direct and indirect player interaction. The wars feel much more impactful. You're pushing a token more, closer and closer to them, and if it gets all the way, they just lose the game. So it's, it's just a much more intense and interesting experience that has a vibe of both of those designers coming together, and I think it works out really well. The other case I'd like to discuss is Pandemic, which was designed by Matt Leacock and was also really popular and successful when it came out. It's a fully cooperative game where players are trying to fend off a bunch of diseases that are trying to kill everybody in the world. Now, Matt Leacock decided he wanted to try out a narrative legacy style into his game, but instead of just reinventing the wheel and figuring out how you do legacy, which if you don't know about that, that's just the idea that the actions you take in one game will have ramifications on future plays of that game within your own box. So he reached out to Rob Davio, who kind of created this mechanism of legacy and narrative gaming with Risk Legacy and a game called Seafall, which he's been designing for many years. So uh, Rob Davio essentially made all the mistakes through design and figured out what to do and what not to do to come up with this great uh, core of gaming. And they came together and he brought all that success in with Matt's success of making great cooperative games. And together they made Pandemic Legacy, which is an amazing feat of board game design because it has that great uh, collaboration of making the pandemic game work, but you also just feel this narrative of game to game, like things are getting worse, things are changing, and I don't think that would have been possible without collaborating between these two experts in each of their own fields. 
I'm sure there are many other examples of this, but these are the two I wanted to highlight. I hope you found this as interesting as I did, and I'll talk to you guys later. Hi folks, today we want to introduce you to some collaborative designers, Eric Lang and Mike Elliott. Yeah, Mike Elliott and, and Eric Lang both have a long history of making various games. Mike Elliott has an extensive background in mostly trading card, collectible card games. The game he's probably most known for before the collaboration would probably be Thunderstone. Yeah. We don't have the original Thunderstone, but we have the new uh, Thunderstone Advance. But his uh, original design, Thunderstone. Eric Lang, on the other hand, probably their, his most famous game, I would think, before the collaboration would be Chaos in the Old World, but we do not own that game, unfortunately. But we do have Call of Thulu, the card game, which is still going strong, I guess like seven years after it was made, maybe eight. Um, it's a very popular game. There's still tournaments all over the place for this game, so that's kind of the uh, what they did before they got together. The first game that Eric and Mike, to use their first names, even though I don't know them very well, collaborated on was Quarriers. And anyone who knows the original Quarriers knows the famous Quarriers 10. Yeah, this is all too neat and too clean. This reporter dug deep to give you the scoop. I found Mike Elliott's designer diary on BoardGameGeek.com and he gives you the dirty scoop on all of this collaboration and some of the dark secrets of all of the behind the scenes action. For example, when he's talking about couriers, he talks about the problems with international relations. And I quote, I did a lot of preparation for the project. I took several courses on the Canadian language and by the time Eric arrived, I was saying A at the end of almost every sentence. And when he goes into talking about Dice Masters, was it doomed to fail? He, Mike Elliott himself admits, Dice Masters started as a bet with Eric Lang. Eric didn't think we could do it and has since paid me uh, the money he lost on that bet. My master plan is to use the winnings from betting Eric to put my son through college. It was a dollar bet. You didn't have to add that part. So There's a lot of information there if you are interested in more of the behind the scenes action with Designer Diary. So yeah, you know, uh, yeah, um, yeah, dice. They, those games have a lot of dice. They do. So now that you've seen the components for Quarriers, Dice Masters, and other assorted games, we want to talk a little bit about their collaboration. The first thing they collaborated on was Quarriers, and around the same time, Mike Elliott was making one of our favorite games of all times, Star Trek Fleet Captain, so I don't know how he found the time to make Quarriers, <laughs> but Quarriers is a great dice game where you purchase dice and attack people, and it's a really fun game. That um, game was the precursor to Dice Masters. Um, Dice Masters is a, basically designed for two players, an amazing two-player game where you basically go mono e mono against each other in a dice chucking game. I love both of them. Both of them hit the top of my all-time favorites list. I agree, absolutely. If you like to play with dice and you like to attack or collect different things. The uh, Dice Masters is more for the collector side of it where you can buy 
separate, you know, packets to add to your deck. But if you don't want to deal with that, uh, the Courier's comes all neat and ready to go with everything in it. So there's a little bit of awesomeness for everyone. I love these games. Definitely. You should check them out. Kids, winning at Dice Masters makes you cool. <laughs> So check these two games out, and thank you so much for watching. Cool yeah. Trays! So, today's theme is designer collaborations. What should we talk about? Um, let's talk about Cyclades, collaborative work of Bruno Catala and Ludovic Moblanc. Yeah, I think that's a cool idea. And you know what? We can tell that... Uh... All components and artwork! So, the board is a bird's eye view map of Cyclades Islands. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. The miniatures are sculpted differently for each faction. It's just mind-blown. Yes, but it's not the most important part of the game. You have the hybrid game. You have a perfect hybrid game. You have a mashup of Euro mechanics and the war game. And it's a perfect mix. That's what makes this game great. I'm not so sure about War Pride. It is so tiny in the game. The game is one of the best balanced games out there. So if you are the first one to get actions of the gods this turn, you will be the last one to bid on the gods next turn. And it is okay. so, so tight. You have so many ways to build your metropolis. So the, it's so easy to miss when your opponent is just one step away from the win. All wins of the game come so unexpectedly and surprisingly. Yeah, but it's nothing. It's nothing without the bidding mechanic. It's the core mechanism of this game. You bid on a god, somebody outbeats you. So you have to bid on another god. Somebody outbeats you there as well, so you can go back to the first god you wanted to beat. You know, you will bluff. You will make your opponents uh, pay more. You will be satisfied or not with your bidding. It's a lot of tension in there. No, no, no. The bidding is just the way you get the actions. And each, at each round you can get action only from one god. So, you cannot build fleet and troop on the same, same round. You cannot on this attack on the same round. You have to plan ahead, you have to make decisions and build up your opportunities. Yeah, but what you can do without the money? You can do any of these things without the money. The money is everything in this game. So, you want to get the actions on the gods, you need to spend money. You want to beat on the gods, you need to spend money. You want to get creatures, buildings, you need to spend a lot of money. Even if you want to get discount on creatures, what you want to do? You need to build a temple. What you need to do for that, you need to spend the money on that temple. Money is everything. Money is a tight resource. Money is like, I just... I love money, yes, by the way. but all of that is nothing without two expansions. These are both essential, Hardest and Titans. Okay. They give you lots of modules that you can mix and match in the game to spice up your gameplay and to make the pre replayability as high as possible. Yeah, I, I think I can agree on that. Uh, expansions are awesome, both of them, and essential. So. Wow, I wonder how designers agree when they create the game, when we cannot even agree when we how to talk about the game. You know, I think I know the answer. I think they just agreed that they must make a great game. And I think they have succeeded. Indeed. It's cool. So, and the other thing that we share in common is that it's a top one on both of our lists. So we agree that this is a great, great game. The best out there. Yeah. What about you? Hey everybody. Since we're talking about dynamic duos, I want to talk about my favorite designer duo of all time. And that is Wolfgang Kramer and Michael Kiesling. They have made so many great games. 
They're most known for their action point system. They did this in a whole series from this game, Torres, and the big three of Tikal and Mexica and Java. And they came up with this whole great system where you each turn you have a certain amount of action points. And there's so many actions you can do, but if I only have five action points, how can I, and I want to do eight things, I only can do five each turn. And they, they're the ones who created this. It's been used in a lot of games since then. Even games like Flashpoint Fire Rescue uses the action point system for each player. And that was all from Kramer and Kiesling. They came up with that novel, novel concept. They also have a whole bunch of other games that I think are great. Maharaja, and it's an amazing, amazing game. Pueblo. Pueblo has this whole 3D aspect where you're going around the board and you look into different parts and you see where things are lined up in the parts. I really like that one. It's an older one, but definitely worth looking at. Nauticus. Nauticus, you're building up these ships and you're collecting stuff and you're getting into different areas to build up your sails and build up stuff on your ship. It's another great game. The Palaces of Carrara. This one, you're, you've got this wheel mechanic that they made where the things spin around and the prices get cheaper and cheaper as you buy them and then you're collecting those so you could get into the different palaces and and some palaces are worth more but you have to spend more materials to get to it and you want to get into different cities and palaces of Carrara is another another great game by them coal baron coal baron you're starting you're digging down you're building out these mines you're mining your stuff up and you're that one has this really cool mechanic where if I put a piece into a space, in order for you to get in the space, you have to put one more piece to me. So you'd have to put two of your pieces in the space. And then someone else wants to go there, they have to put three of their pieces into the space. Very, very cool, unique mechanic that Kramer and Kiesling did. That's and basically some of their great games. As I said, their biggest known thing is the action point system. And if you really want to find one to call or I guess To Call 2 is now the newer version that just came out or was re-released, but you could find it anywhere. And it's definitely, I think Mexico just got re-released as well. So if you're looking for one of their games and you want to learn about the limited action point system, definitely, definitely look for Kramer and Kiesling and they are my designer spotlight for this week. Hey, hey folks. For today's quirky game, I uh, wanted to take a look at a design I like to call the Game of Life, the adult version. Now, the Game of Life, as you're probably very aware of, is uh, a, a family-slash-kids game, very popular game, in which you are sort of taking your character through many specific life stages and doing, you know, things like uh, going to school and getting married and getting a job and uh, having kids, things like that. And so in this game, you are doing many of those same things. But again, uh, it's an adult-themed game, and I'm talking here about uh, Funny Friends, of course. And as you might be able to tell from the green cover and the alliterative title here, this is a Friedman Fries uh, design, and he did this one with uh, Marcel Andre Casasola Merkel, who uh, you might not be aware of as much, but has some great designs under his belt, games like Attica and uh, Taluva. Uh, several others. He's also a very accomplished uh, artist as well, who's been off the scene for some time now, it, it seems, but uh, a very bright guy. And then uh, Friedman Fries, of course, has a ton of designs under his belt, very eclectic uh, catalog to him. And this is one of the more uh, strange ones, I would say. In this game, you are going to be attempting to accomplish some life goals, you know, and they can be a variety of things and so uh, you are going to have some cards that tell you what it is you want to accomplish and then you are going to go through some life stages you go through puberty you go through adulthood etc etc you're going to be keeping track of what you need to do using one of these uh, cards here which is going to track in front of you specific stats and several things things like you know how how fat or thin you are how happy or depressed uh, how much you read, things like that. And, um, and those are some of the more, um, I guess, PC ones. <laughs> the board here is going to have a lot of tokens and stuff on it that you manipulate up and down, depending on what cards you acquire. And the cards are uh, auctioned off, so you can bid to acquire those, and then once you have it, you adjust your little tableau there. 
the game mechanisms, ultimately, to be perfectly honest, are uh, not that revolutionary. It's, it's pretty straightforward bidding. And uh, the game itself is perhaps a little long. The, uh, the flow is perhaps a little slow. But ultimately, if you're playing this game with some buddies, it's not because of the game mechanisms as much as it is for the story that you'll hopefully be developing and it, it sort of tells your your life story you know and, and they can be pretty funny they can be very interesting it's a very tongue-in-cheek kind of game it's a, it's a game that's probably not very easy to find at this point unfortunately it has been out of print for some time but it's just sort of amazing that at one point this was printed uh here in the united states anyway by by rio grande games and this is probably the only one they ever did that was sort of like this, you know. Um, so I thought I'd point it out. I think it's a very clever design. I think it's um, it's a brave thing to put out here in the uh, States. You know, it's uh, I can see this coming out from 2F is fine, you know, from the original publishing company. But um, I, it's not the kind of thing you would expect to see here. And I don't think it did very well, really, which is probably why uh, it isn't here now. But clever, interesting, uh, I kind of, you know, it's not something that comes out all the time, but I think it's, um, it's the kind of thing you'll pull out with some, you know, buddies and be like, look at this thing, let's give it a shot and see what kind of stories we get. And if you're cool with that and you're okay, you're, you're on board with the theme, I think you're gonna dig it. So there you go, a, a bit um, of an, you know, left fielder for a quirky game, but... A good one, and I think these guys are both brilliant designers, and seeing them work together, that's just cool. So there you have it, guys. Funny friends. Hey, folks, welcome back to another segment of Real Talk with Sam. Today, we're talking about designer collaborations, where two designers work together on the same game. And uh, the one guy that immediately came to my mind was Bruno Catala. He's worked with a lot of different people. Many of the games that he has designed, I do enjoy a lot. So maybe he is. I haven't really done all of the numbers and crunched them uh, to see if he is my favorite, but he's definitely up there in the top of the list. So the first game I'd like to talk to you about today is Cleopatra and the Society of Architects. This is a design that uh, Bruno did with Ludovic Montblanc, and uh, it is the first game that I ever played where you actually use the box, that I can recall at least, where the box is actually part of the game board, and I thought that was uh, amazing. On top of that, the pieces that come in this game are very eye-catching. When somebody's playing this game on the table, people's attention are immediately drawn to this game. Uh, you're basically going around and each player takes the role of different architects that are helping build um, uh, Cleopatra's palace. And so there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of card play that's in there, uh, using your resources to build certain things, pillars and and, and uh, statues and, and that type of thing, mosaics up in the garden. There's a lot of different stuff going on. I love this game, Shadows Over Camelot. Doesn't hit the table as much as it used to, but it is still one of, the, one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, I love the cooperative aspect. This is one of the first, not the first, but this is one of the first games that brought cooperative play uh, into my spectrum on top of having that traitor aspect that's there. And then the most recent game that I'd like to talk about today is, you probably were guessing that it was coming, Raptor. This one was designed by Bruno Cathala and Bruno Fiduti, and it's a two-player asymmetrical game where you each have your own uh, deck of cards that have different uh, powers and abilities in them, and they're all numbered, and uh, the core mechanic of the game is basically picking which number you're going to play, and whoever plays the higher card uh, gets to do a number of actions on the board, moving your pieces around, attacking the other players' pieces, and stuff like that. The, and then the person that is that plays the lower card gets to do the special ability that's on the card. So there's this back and forth, there's a tension there. Very neat, clean, uh, two-player tactical game. So look, I hope you enjoyed my segment. Uh, these are three games that I don't really get to talk a lot about, although I have talked recently about Raptor a lot because it's so cool and it just came out last year. But uh, these are great collaborations. Bruno, Ludovic Mavlon, um, 
Sears Lajet and Bruno Fuduni helped make these games with Bruno Cathala. Love them. Look, just trying to keep it real, folks. See you on the flip side. And that, ladies and gentlemen, wraps up our Designer Collaborators episode. A uh, big thanks to all my contributors for all of their segments, and a big thanks to you for tuning in, for watching the show, for commenting, interacting with us. We certainly appreciate it, so thanks for that. And I hope to see you again in a couple of weeks, where we'll be talking about uh, Fantastic Worlds. That'll be our next episode, and we're going to be talking about Strange New Lands, uh, brave new worlds, you know, things like that. We're going to have a lot of fun with that one. So come on back for that. And as always, hey, stay a friend of the blend. I'll see you.